that transformation in me was going from a really good nurse to be a transformational nurse, not only transformational in the way I practice, but also how do I transform the lives of other people I work around? How do I transform the lives of my patient? And how do I empower everybody through what I've learned to, to make things better? You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Frederick, and this is episode 77. In this show, I interview Dr. Jennifer Duco. Jennifer has been sharing her passion for nursing for nearly 40 years. She is a graduate of the Florence Nightingale School of Nursing in London, England, and received her Master's of Science in Nursing Administration from Walden University and her Doctor of Nursing Practice from Aspen University. In this episode, we discuss her journey and the transformational nature of a doctoral degree. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thanks, Heather. Great to be here. I would love to start with you just reflecting back on where you were in life and what was going on that caused you to make this decision to start your doctoral program. So I finished my master's of science in nursing in 2013. And uh, I made a very, very good friend on that course. And both of us were like, oh, we're done. And oh, maybe six months a year later, we started saying, hmm, really miss school, really miss diving into evidence-based practice, really miss the whole environment that we, that we have going on, you know, in our work lives versus what we were doing and the progress we were making and the personal growth we were seeing when we were in school. And so that friend and I, after about a year, started saying, well, maybe we should start looking. And then it was we both got gray hair. Oh, I'll speak for myself. She doesn't have as much as me. Anyway, she, we started looking and saying, should we go to school? Should we do it at our age? And we went back and forth and we'd have discussions on the phone. Yes, no, yes, no. And then I started looking. I was like, I don't know if I want to invest that much money in school at this point in my career. She said the same thing, but we kept looking. And, and then Aspen University came along and she had called me and she said, I've just been at a conference. You have got to check out this program because I think it meets our needs. It is a doctoral program and it is super affordable. And so I went on and looked at it. I couldn't believe how affordable it was. And of course you think, oh, catch 22, you know, so is it accredited? Is it this? Is it that? Is it the other? By this time, we were nearly five years out from our master's program and I took the plunge and said, yes, I want to do it and jumped in with two feet and didn't never look back. So Jennifer, you said a few things I'd love to unpack a little more. And the first okay. was that you were wondering, wow, at this stage in my life, what, what is this the right decision? So you had a successful career. You had been working as a nurse for decades. Yes, <laughs> three decades, probably. Three plus decades. Somewhere around there. Yeah, close to. And what we're finding is, you know, decades ago, it was more typical. The average doctoral student maybe finished their bachelor's, went on to their master's, went on to their, and they were almost honed for this, trained for this app apprenticeship type model. Whereas what we're seeing more and more today, thank you to hybrid and online types of delivery modalities, is that many mid-career professionals are having this moment of reflection, maybe is the best way to put it. You said you had finished your master's and you're missing that growth that being in an academic setting gave you. And so here you are deciding, I'm going to go back to school at whatever age a later age. Did family and friends question your decision here? So 
my husband, of course, had been in on the discussion ever since the master's program and it didn't phase him at all. And some people said, you know, are you crazy? And friends and colleagues who are similar age, similar point in their career just said, oh, it's not for me. I, I just don't want to do that, you know. And friends of our age have married children and grandkids and that, and we don't yet. And I don't know if that would have made a difference, quite honestly. I think for me, I, I'll be quite honest, I was that 20-year employee that said, I'm a nurse. I'm a fantastic nurse. I'm an RN. I trained at St. Thomas's Hospital, Florence Nightingale School of Nursing. I'm a really good nurse. And how dare anybody say I'm not? And <laughs> I had a, a fantastic mentor who had actually been the same way, but she'd gone back and got her bachelor's degree. She was a supervisor of mine at the time. And I saw a transformation in her that I had never imagined I would see. And she became a mentor and she saw in me leadership skills at that time in my career that I hadn't seen. And she just said to me, if you want to progress, the com you know, every company is getting to the point where they're really starting to look at people's higher education. You really should think about going back. So that was when I was an RN and I decided to do the RN to MSN program. It was a three years and very reasonable versus RN to BSN and BSN to MSN. So I had a very, very good experience and it completely changed my mindset. I was like, here I am 20 years on, didn't know what I didn't know and completely transformed me into a proponent for everybody should go back to school. Everybody should go and learn what they don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And that's become one of my mantras really is when people are saying, you know, well, I'm an RN and I'm a great RN. And I say, yeah, but you just don't know how much even more mind blast you can have when you go back to school and how much more you can learn and how much more impact you can have, more influence you can have when you've got schooling behind you and you know what to look for and know how to approach things. And just, just the whole experience for me, I'm a con took me 20 years. Was that a bad thing? No, because I took a whole bunch of experience into my program. And I think it's really obvious when you're in some of these programs who wants to be there and who needs to be there. That's something that you can really tell. Even on the discussion boards, you can see who really wants to be there. And I wanted to be there and it, and it really, I just dived in, loved every minute of it. You've brought up this word twice, transformation. And when you talk about the difference between the types of people that are showing up in, in higher ed programs, do you think that maybe that's one of the variables, this need, desire, or maybe even just willingness to transform? I think so. You know, magnet programs are out there. and A lot of them are talking about transformational leadership. And so you get all these buzzwords that come around or you read something or it pops up in a piece of continuing education. I remember somebody saying, oh, yeah, I work in a magnet hospital and I'm going, oh, that's nice. What's that? <laughs> and I think some of those things that you learn about in school and that you see benefit our patients, no matter what setting you're in, those all come about from the learning experience that you have. And it really gives you the, an empowerment tool. You know, that transformation in me was going from a really good nurse to be a transformational nurse, not only transformational in the way I practice, but also how do I transform the lives of other people I work around? How do I transform the lives of my patient? And how do I empower everybody through what I've learned to, to make things better? You know, how does it, it, all the methodology and everything that you learn in school is all about making things better for our patients. I work in dialysis. We have a very unique population. Some of these patients we see three times a week for 20, 30 years. Some of them you see more, more than, you, than your own family. And to be able to, to see things and transform things and put ideas out there and implement programs that transforms their lives just through simple tweaks of programs or being able to see a gap in, you know, what we're doing for them or with them or to enable them or empowering them to do, it just makes such a huge difference. There's that quote that knowledge is power. And when I hear oh, yes. you talk, <laughs> it sounds like 
that is absolutely the experience you had both in your master's and your doctoral program, that it was more than just going to a class, taking a test, writing a paper. It was really a broadening of your horizon, of your perspective for different situations. I would agree with that. And I think most of it boils down to what you want to put into it, because I truly believe you're going to get out what you put in. As I say, when you have people who want to be there and people who need to be there, you could see a difference in the need people. They need to be there because somebody said to be magnet, you have to get masters. And you'd see these people and it, it, and I'm not saying a broad spectrum, everybody in that situation, but there were some people you could see, oh, well, they've done the minimum. And I could never do the minimum when there was more to be said. <laughs> and I think because you get in that mode and you, you get into great discussions with people, even in that, on my, both my courses were totally online. We got into some fantastic discussions and seeing the world through a different lens, not only the lens, I, I hardly, I don't know, I maybe encountered one other dialysis nurse throughout my studies. Everybody else was in completely different settings from flight nurses to ICU nurses to psychiatric nurses. I mean, every, every path that a nurse could take that have been through these programs and it was fascinating to me, you know, here was I in my little blinkered world of dialysis going well, centers for Medicaid and Medicaid services and Medicare are just, you know, really the people who we need to look out for. And it's only us that get affected by their decisions. And then all of a sudden you're in this discussion and it's like, well, CMS expect this of us and CMS expect this of us. And you're going, oh, <laughs> you know, just even something as simple as rules, regulations, Medicare, Medicaid, reimbursement, all that stuff that we get so embroiled in in our jobs. And it was like, everybody's dealing with this. And just a fascinating way to, to be able to see that broadened horizon and that broadened knowledge of we're all in this together. How can we help each other? So your programs really gave you the opportunity to diversify your network. Yes, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And I'm curious, you mentioned that a friend was coming along with you on this journey. How important do you think that was as you were going through your program to have that? So this friend is an interesting story that because this friend actually I made in my master's program. She was somebody who obviously wanted to be there. And she and I used to get on discussion boards and we pretty much paralleled our courses all the way through our master's program. And when we were in our, because we did RN to MSN, we were in our, as it were, undergraduate. And you have those lovely group assignments that everybody loves, she said. And so the two of us decided we'd be editor one, editor two in some of these groups. And of course, you got people who sent in work that was a little less than par. And we were not going to not get an A because of somebody's less than par work. So it became very obvious that we had same sort of goals, similar sort of thought processes, we ended up spending hours on the phone doing all the group projects together to, you know, send stuff back and please fix this or, you know, putting our projects together. And be, we became firm friends. And would you believe I'm in Tennessee, my friend was in New Jersey, and my husband's family, one of them got very, very, very sick and went to my friend's hospital. My sister-in-law had a brain aneurysm that burst and she went to the ICU and the operating room where my friend was at this hospital and I called her up and I said, isn't this the hospital that you work at? And she said, yep. And I told her what was going on and she hung up and 30 minutes later, she called me and she said, I am here with your family. Wow. And it really was a wow. And talk about firming a friendship because she spent hours with my family, supporting them, loving them, you know, get very emotional about it, but she is a lifelong friend. And even my husband, who flew up to see his sister that night, sent me a picture the next day with her. Nah, 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 nah. I got to meet her in person before you did. <laughs> so this friend, she works at a, a hospital in New Jersey. And so we went through our master's program together. And she was the one that we were going back and forth. Should we do our doctorate? Should we do our doctorate? And we both started. And then unfortunately, she had some health issues and work got really busy. And, 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 and so... I got to do the whole doctoral program. Did she stick with me through it? She might not have been in the doctoral program, which was our original plan. But those Saturdays when I woke up knowing I had a paper to write and I had a writer's block, 
that friend was the first person I got like, I don't know what to say. Help me. And she'd go, the team. I go, nope, it's not going to work. She'd go, the physicians. No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. <laughs> so she, she'd tell me a little bit more about what you're trying to figure out. And she would help me. She was a wonderful thinking partner just to get me off the ledge many, many times throughout the doctoral program. I love that twist to your story because you both obviously had the skill set, the motivation, the determination, but your friend's life, it just wasn't the right time. And I think there's exactly. a lot of people out there listening where they're thinking, I want to do this, but it's not a small endeavor and you need right. to advocate for yourself and know when it's the right time to do this program. And it was for you and it wasn't for her, but you right. kept your friendship and she was able to support you through it, which is so beautiful. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Wonderful having somebody like that. And I'm trying to do that for employees and students. I'm a, a strong advocate for mentoring students as they are passing through, mostly in my own work environment. And just knowing that there's somebody there, I mean, even my own employees, if so, I don't care what time you call me, day or night, if you're stuck, you're on the ledge, you can't, you just cannot get past the first word. You don't know where to start, call me. I'll, I'll think through it with you. I'll help you. I, I took, <laughs> took lessons from my friend, the team, the head of the floor, the, the DON, <laughs> chief nursing officer, where do you want to start? No, it won't work. Okay, well, let's think of another angle. We'll get you through it. Don't worry. <laughs> well, Jennifer, I'm curious. You are reflecting on so many positive experiences and memories of going through your education and all the benefits. Was there any time during your doctoral program where it felt like a real challenge or a real struggle or you were thinking, this isn't what I thought it was going to be? Yes, I think the hardest course for me was the very first course in my project where the pace of putting together chapter after chapter after chapter was more than a full-time job. So I was working a full-time job. I would literally, I don't know, if my, if my husband didn't know how to cook, I, I'd, I'd be half the size <laughs> now because he fed me. He, he brought cups of tea to me all hours, day and night, but I would literally finish work and I'm remote working. I'd go downstairs, I'd have my dinner and I'm like, see you later. And it would be five, six hours every night, 14, 15, 16 hours at the weekend. And at the end of that, I just said, I, I don't know if I can do this. There was no work-life balance, which I had managed to achieve. I was in tears many times. And luckily, I have a husband who said, it'll be okay. It'll be okay tomorrow. Just keep going. It'll be okay. And I actually took eight weeks off after that course. I needed a mental break. I needed some mental time to process I, I just felt like I was drowning and the water kept doing this and I'd come up and then, I'd, you know, week after week. And there was some, there was some hiccups, technical hiccups with papers, not getting the comments on them and professor who was upset that I hadn't made corrections. Well, I hadn't seen corrections because there was a technical hitch and it was just, it was a vicious cycle of, of quite a few things that compounded the stress levels to say the least. My hubby was the biggest one to say, you can't give up at this point and uh, just go back. It'll be okay. And I had a very supportive school. I had a situation with, with a professor and it speak up. If you are not getting on with a professor, speak up. I think there are some people that don't get on with a professor or they get annoyed or ticked off at the way something's happened. And rather than speak up and say, could I change? Could I do this again? Could I have a different professor? I made all the difference in the world. So Again, you've got to advocate for yourself. And I think in how you approach maybe issues that you're having, be an advocate for yourself and ensure that you don't just give up, especially when you get way through a program and you had an end goal when you started it. It wasn't to give up. It was to finish. <laughs> yes. And you know that pacing that you bring up when you get to either the project stage or the dissertation stage is something that everyone brings up. You said before you were able to maintain a work-life balance, you had your courses, you were working your job, maybe you're even making some of the meals, and then boom, it's almost like you hit a wall. You get to the last phase of the program, and people aren't ready for it. It's almost like, I will often say, it's almost like having a baby. People can tell you. 
<laughs> yeah. Things are going to change when that baby gets here and you have the nursery painted and you've got the fridge stocked and you think you've got every T cross and every I dotted and you got this. And then the baby comes and you're like, oh my gosh, they were right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I would agree with that. But it sounds like you had two things that kept you really anchored and on course. And that was a very supportive partner, mm -hmm. which is huge. Absolutely. So yep. all of you out there listening who maybe maybe this is a great time to thank someone who's been there to remind you that tomorrow's a new day. Or maybe it's a conversation you need to have if you need more support that you're not getting. Because often I've heard from family members, partners say, I don't even know how to support someone in this endeavor. They're chronically stressed. They're overwhelmed. I, I don't even know what to say or how to support them. So to just open up those lines of communication. But secondly, it sounds like you always knew your why. You always had your eyes on the prize. You knew why you were doing this and you weren't going to give up. Yeah, I would say so. And the other thing was I wasn't time bound. You know, at first you go into a program and they say, oh, you can do it in X number of months. And I looked at that and said, well, I don't think I want to do that. One of the beauties of the course I did was that they have an every two week start, which for me is fantastic because I would say, oh, I could take a course and take two weeks off. I could very much arrange family vacations. And I think that's important. Don't just go course over course over course over course. I'm a big proponent of taking a break, coming back refreshed, being more productive when you've taken a break. And I think that was huge for me too. It was, I could have done it in, I don't know, I don't know what they say, 26, 28 months. And it took me three years. It was right at three years. And that was a decent pace. As I said, I took eight weeks off, but I was like, oh, well. <laughs> just, just like naps, I'm a big proponent of naps. I'm also a big proponent of breaks if that's what your body, mind, and spirit are calling for. Because yes. honestly, I have seen it where you're not just extending your program by X number of weeks. Often you're actually finishing earlier because you're preventing the burnout. You're preventing yes. problems at home. You're preventing problems at work that are going to cost you time and energy later. You're preventing health problems. You can't do this if you're not on top of your game. So yes. breaks, some people are really against them because yes, there is some research that shows if you take a break, you might not come back. But I argue, well, if you take a break and you don't come back, you've made the decision that's best for you. <laughs> right. right. I think the other thing, you know, I, I took on a new job right at the time during that whole stressful period, that first eight weeks, I happened to get a new job too. And it was insane. Trying to learn a new job, trying to write. Yeah. And that break was exactly what I needed to get my feet on the ground over here. Take a break, take a breather. I think I had a vacation in there and I didn't expect to take eight weeks. I thought a couple, I would do it. And I wasn't ready after a couple. And I said, well, what does it matter if it's two, four, six or eight? Class will start again. I'm going to go back and I'll feel better sorted over here in my life instead of everything being completely stressful. So took care of one stressor over here while giving this one a break. So I was in good shape when I went back. Yeah, the program will always be there, but your yeah. health or your family or your job might not be right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm curious, do you mentor doctoral students now? Yes, I've got two doctoral students and I've got lots of them pinging me all the time. <laughs> so I'm sure we'll, that I'll get into more, but I talk to many of them. They'll call and ask for advice and things. And it's one of the things I absolutely love is coaching and mentoring people. It's very much something that makes me very happy just to be able to be a thinking partner with them. Or if they're looking for advice, I can tell you what it was for me, but you've got to figure out what it is for you. Think about this. Think about that. Each individual person is so very different. And we've all got to figure out what it is ourselves that we need. But if I can help somebody through the journey and tell them it's going to be okay. And as I said, you started the program for a reason because you wanted to get to the end game. That should be your goal. And it doesn't really matter if you need to take a break. Sometimes it's people highly stressed that are calling, what should I do? Why don't you take a break? <laughs> Often I will ask towards the end of the podcast, if you have any final words of wisdom or a favorite quote that you use to get through the program. And I, I love this. Take a break if you need to take a break. I'm curious. My last question for you is if there were any listeners out there right now that were debating, should I or shouldn't I? Maybe it's too late. Maybe my ship has sailed. I don't know that this is the right choice for me. Do you have any common 
things that you say to them or, or bits of advice that you give? I will say to them, there's a reason you're thinking about doing it. And myself, I, I'm 30 odd years now in the profession and I'm lucky enough I, I could approach retirement at any point from this point on. And I know that as my brother retired early and he said to me, oh, now you've got your doctorate, you can retire at the pinnacle of your career. And I just thought that was a wonderful thing to think about was, you know, there isn't another terminal degree I want to do. I really feel like I've gained and used all this knowledge. Uh, I'm not ready to retire. But if you're thinking about it, you're thinking about it for a reason. There's something niggling at you. Uh, and don't think of it as a sprint. Think of it as a marathon. And if you were to finish your doctoral program in three years' time and retire the next day, wow. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing your story, your experience, and your words of wisdom with the listeners. It was such a joy to chat with you today. Wonderful to chat with you. And I wish each and every one that listens good luck if they decide to journey. It's a, it's a fantastic journey. Thanks so much for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Until then, I'm wishing you more joy in your journey. The Happy Doc Student Podcast is brought to you by expandyourhappy.com, and you can learn more there. Hey, one more thing, just a quick reminder that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only. 